John chapter 4. And we, the context of this is, is Jesus has met the woman at Samaria. And, and this is Great Expectations Part 2. I spoke on Great Expectations the other week. And I, to be honest, I can't go much further. There's other things I need to discharge in my message today. And I, I couldn't go any further um, other than to bring you uh, some of this. Jesus said after meeting the, the woman, Jesus modeled life. You know, he didn't turn around and say, right, here's a questionnaire to fill in. Or look at these three points that begin with A. Or he modeled, he modeled how it should be. And he spoke to this woman and he told this woman and he, 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 he did things that were totally out of the box. And he told this woman he, through divine wisdom and knowledge. And the disciples were kind of little, little bit absolutely so amazed. They, they, at one point, they, the Bible says they daren't speak. They were so amazed at Jesus. And then he says, he, he said in John chapter 4, if you pick the reading up with me, it, in John chapter 4, 34, he says, Jesus says, my food, my meat, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say four months and then the harvest? Question, it's rhetorical. Of course we do. But I tell you, open your eyes, look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Are we looking in the right place? Are we looking where Jesus wants us to look? Because I I believe we need to be looking at the right thing. We need to be facing in the right direction in our lives and understand that God has called us to be witnesses and God has called us to be ambassadors, messengers into certain communities. Now, we might not be able to go to them all. In fact, we won't be able to go to them all. But God has called us to go to some communities that if we do not go, they will not hear. If we do not go, they will not hear. So it is absolutely imperative that we understand where we are positioned in life right now and where God has placed us right now is not an accident. There are people around you and in your circle who you need to be an example to and a model to and a a role model to, but you also need to be a messenger because the messenger backed up with the caliber of your life has the power to transform and change people through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, do you believe that? You don't sound convinced. (laughs) Um, Just this week, there were three words that that the Lord really dropped into my heart. And I I couldn't go any further without these words. I'll, I'll give these words to you. This was the slide I used last time I preached. Great expectations for our church, for our city, our community. And I remember when I spoke last time, do you remember I told you the word that was spoken over our city from a pastor that I would call from another tribe? Because we've got lots of tribes. And they all belong to the Lord. But this was, for, this was a guy from, a, from, from the vineyard in Belfast. And he was preaching to about two and a half to 3,000 people. Uh, Delhi was there, Jesse was there, I was there, a couple of the pastors from northern towns in Manchester. And we were there, and and the guy, as he was preaching, he broke off from, and he turned around and he said to the whole audience, he said, he says, watch Manchester. Because God is about to do something amazing over the city of Manchester. And he's going to use his church to do it. So watch the churches in Manchester and even the surrounding towns and areas that had, had, had been so tough and so hard. I mean, I, pre- I preached in Rochdale last year. And my goodness me, I, I, I thought I needed a passport. And I went into a, an estate there and I preached on the estate. And, I, and, and, and I'm, I'm telling you now, it was like, it was like speaking to concrete. Thought, I'll, I'll okay, explain. Speaking to concrete. But God has the authority and the ability placed within his people 
with, within his people to penetrate the most difficult, the most uh, obstinate of places. I, I, saw a, I saw a photo this week. Somebody sent it to me. And there were these beautiful little flowers. And I wish I had the photo now to put up. And they had grown. And you say, well, what's special about those? They just look like a bunch of pansies or whatever, you know. And there they were. They had grown through concrete. That almost, it, it, it defies science, that, doesn't it? If you think about it. How can something as soft as a little flower, I'll tell you how, persistence, determination. And they had cracked the concrete and come through. Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. And I, 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 in 30 years, I cannot remember a time where I, 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 I feel so expectant that God is going to do something. Now, I'm not a big revivalist, I have to say. So please don't chuck me out as a heretic. It's just that revival is doing an old thing again. And I'm expectant for a new thing, that God wants to do a new thing. A new thing. A thing that's not been done before. A thing that God is doing that's new in new people and unchurched people and non-believers and atheists and agnostics and people who are so far away from God. It's, it's unbelievable. God wants to reach those people in this last time harvest. On June the 23rd, we have a referendum. We have a situation happening in our nation. I can't remember a vote as important as this next one. But God will not be surprised on the June the 25th. He already knows what the landscape looks like, and he's still God and he's still in control. But I want to tell you now, June 23 is linked to the harvest. It's linked to the harvest. However the vote goes, it's linked to the harvest. And I said last night in our African night of praise that everybody who is here now from wherever they've come, from Azerbaijan to Kyrgyzstan, is here in the plan and the will of God. Whether you're from, whether you're from Tivington or Timbuktu, God is in control and he's in charge. God is doing something in the landscape of our nation and in the landscape of our nation and the landscape of our world. Don't kid yourself. People look at it and it's, it looks like an absolute melting pot of chaos. But I'm telling you now, in the midst and over all of that, God is in supreme control. He's in supreme control. And, 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 and Jesus says, I want you to look up at the fields. And there are very few things that Jesus said, I want you to pray for this. You try and think of anything where Jesus said to his disciples, I want you to pray about this. You won't find many things. Okay, in the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation. He's, he's asking us to pray over that. He's asking us to pray. But there's not loads of things. He didn't give us a shopping list to pray for. Some people think he did, but they're mistaken, he didn't. He exemplified a lifestyle of prayer to the Father. And he says, my, my food is to do the will. To do the will of him who sent me. And he modeled that through his life. And it was very, very short in his ministry, three, three years, three and a half years. And he modeled that. And at the end of Jesus' life, you wouldn't have thought he was very successful at all. Because people forsook him and fled. In actual fact, I've said it to you many times in John chapter 6, the devil's verse, 666, six, verse 66. It says they forsook him and fled. Because they were all loving it when he healed the sick and he raised the dead and he, he opened the eyes of the blind and they absolutely loved it. But when he started teaching stuff that meant they had to make some sacrifice and they had to do some stuff that was hard to do, it says they forsook him and fled. And I want to say this today, it's one thing to be a cultural Christian in church, it's another thing to be a missional Christian out there. But the Lord doesn't want you to be a cultural Christian, he wants you to be a missional Christian. He wants you to be somebody who will serve him, and, and live for him, and, and, and go for him, and be an ambassador for him. Have we got any takers on that? See, God wants us to be people who carry his presence and carry his word. 
God wants us to be able to be willing to speak. Sometimes you will feel weak. Sometimes you will feel, no way am I doing this. I, 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 there's no way. And we feel intimidated. And I mentioned that the other week about the scarecrow. Remember that? The scarecrow is an advert to smart crows. Remember? It, 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 it's there to put people, and people get put off by things that are not dangerous. Then it, there's no risk where there's a scarecrow. It's just a bale of straw made to look like something. And that's what Satan does to intimidate Christians and put them off from sharing the great gospel, the great, the good news to, to men and women. And, and Jesus said, go into, he says, he says pray, therefore, because the harvest so, is so big, Jesus said, because the harvest is so big, it's so vast, it's so wide, it's so deep, I want you to pray that the Lord of the harvest will send forth laborers. Anybody know what a laborer is? It's not somebody who belongs to a political party. Anybody know what a laborer is? A laborer is a worker, a somebody who will, who will serve the Lord and do whatever it takes, right? Sometimes we aspire, but we, we refuse to perspire. But if you want to fulfill your aspiration, it's going to take you some perspiration as well. If we want to, how many of us know there's a big gap between what we dream and what we do? That's because when we dream, we don't follow it up with a plan. We just stay in dream mode. It's called slumberland. And it's free to dream. It costs you something to fulfill your dream. It's free to dream, but fulfilling your dream may cost you everything that you've got in the tank and more. Now, how many people want to fulfill their dreams? How many people want to see their dreams come to true? I, I've got no problem preaching dream big, but if you're going to dream big, at least plan small. If you, if you dream big and don't plan, you've got no way that you're going to realize that dream at all. Plans have to follow dreaming. Honestly, honestly. That's why we have people sat in churches that have great dreams. There's nothing wrong with the dreams. They have great visions, but you don't see them fulfilled. I spoke in our Eritrean church a few weeks ago, and I spoke on the purposes of God, and I spoke on having a dream, and, and I spoke on that, and dreaming is fantastic, but we can't leave dreams just there. We can't leave the harvest field and say, look how good the harvest field is. Oh, it's big, it's ripe, it's big, it's great. We have to do something about that. We have to have a plan. And you say, well, I haven't got a plan. Well, get one. You can't go and buy one at Costco. You've got to, you've got to get before God and say, what do you think is the best plan for you? So one of the Eritrean guys, he says to me, Pastor Paul, he says, and he whispered because of his Pastor Mahari, who I spoke to afterwards. He whispered, Pastor Paul, I want to be a professional footballer. As if it's, he's, he's, he's just said the, the most terrible word. I says, there's no problem if you want to be a professional footballer. <laughs> if this is your dream, if this is your goal, go for it. I says, what are you doing about it? And I, I actually said to him, I said, why are you here on a Sunday night if, you should, if your team's playing? Oh, he's a pastor, pastor. I said, leave the pastor to me. So Pastor Mahari, let my people go. <laughs> he was very good about it, actually. Because every dream, you have to have a strategy and a plan, because you have to have a plan to go to fulfill it, otherwise it's going to remain a dream. Listen, when you go somewhere in your car, hopefully you've got fuel in the tank, otherwise you ain't going nowhere, yeah? If you're going somewhere, you don't know. You're going somewhere very fast. I just cheat. I've got a great sat-nav. So I get the coordinates, and, the, and, and I put the coordinates in the sat-nav, yeah? So N14QYP. Never been there before, right? So I don't, put, I don't turn the engine on. Put the coordinates in the sat-nav, the postcode, and then say, right. That's me done. 
And I know that they're going to bring cars out that are driverless and, and park themselves. And I think, oh, Lord, that's so boring. Who would want a car that drove itself? I mean, for goodness sake, can you? I, some of you probably would too. And some of you, it would help your driving technique too. I've no doubt about that. I've seen some of you drive when I've overtaken you. You know when it says 30, it doesn't mean 20. Pastor, it doesn't mean 50 either. I know. I know. But, but listen, when you put the coordinates into your sat-nav, you can't just stay there. You've got to drive the car to get the next piece of information. Got it? So when you drive the car, it says, mine says, all right, when you drive to the end of the road, Take your left-hand turn. Go down the main carriageway to the roundabout. It doesn't say roundabout. What is that? The island. It's half American. She's half American. She's, a, she's got a lovely voice. It's not quite Joanna Lumley. But I, I haven't taped Magsies in there. Right. Take a right. Down there. T straight on. Right. No. Straight on. No. I said straight on. <laughs> But in order to get the information, I have, this, is, this is the point I want to make to you guys. In order to get the information, I have to be driving forward. And God calls people who are in motion. Not people who say, I've got a dream. Sit down. I'm going to dream. God's going to do this in my life. God's going to do that. And I guess what, Pastor? God's going to, I believe God's going to do this and do that and do the other. <laughs> wakey, wakey. What? The bigger the dream. The more you'll need to plan and prepare, and the more you will need to work at that. And some, and guess what? You'll have to get through disappointments. You'll get, you'll have to get through failures. You'll have to get through moments where you trip over your own feet, and there's nobody else to blame but you. Even God can't take the blame for that. Even though you'll try. Oh Lord, what did you do? Lead, lead me in. You put the sat nav coordinates in, not me. But when you put the postcode in when you, and you start to drive, you start to get the instructions. You don't get all the instructions right at the beginning when you're stationary. Why? Because you couldn't take it. You wouldn't remember any of it. So it has to be a step-by-step -step process. The problem is some of, us have stepped, some of us have stopped at the third step. And some of us are in that plateau in our lives and you listen what the Lord's saying to you, you need to get going again. You need to get back on track. You need to get your life back on track. And yes, you can, this is where the scripture says you can redeem the time if you get heading in the right direction. You won't redeem the time by doing nothing. We redeem the time by giving it to the Lord and saying, Lord, I'm going to move forward. We're going to move forward together in Jesus' name. I said before, you know, in, in terms of cultural Christians, we've got lots of churches, they've got lots of cultural Christians. And what I mean by that is people in Christians in name only. If you gave them a phone, it's oh, definitely, a, I'm a nailed on the wall. I'm a Christian, nailed on, I'm a Christian. But if there was, if you were being accused of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Because just going to church and reading our Bible, even doing the word for today, <laughs> which is brilliant, it, that doesn't make us what God wants us to be. And listen, listen to this. Church cannot disciple you. Don't ever think that a church can disciple you. Disciples disciple disciples. Disciples make disciples, not churches make disciples. Church is the collective body come together. That doesn't make you a disciple. Another disciple will enable you to be another disciple. Because it's disciples who bring you. 
It's disciples who influence you. It's other disciples, and we have the terms mentoring, coaching, you name it. You, you, there's lots of words for it, but you have to have somebody to enable you, somebody to walk with, somebody to walk alongside with you to become a disciple. It's, it, if you think about it, the term disciple is a, is a term that talks about being in motion, doesn't it? Father, help us to be missional Christians. Oh, God, help us to have the passion. Do you know what I want? I, 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 I dream to see, and I'm trying to plan for it. I'm preaching for it, and I'm planning for it. I'd love, I said, Lord, will you give us hundreds and hundreds of passionate, persuasive people? Go for it, Nancy. We've got one. Passionate, persuasive people. Who's a passionate, persuasive person? Woo! Who wants to be a passionate, persuasive person? Hallelujah! Somebody just nearly fell off the seat. They just woke up. Praise God. Get those co coordinates in your in yourself. Start to drive in Jesus' name. God will give you what you need. Every step of the way, he will give you what you need to get you to where you need to go in Jesus' name. And, and, and I want to say this now. I, I, I foresee in the future over a thousand people on a Sunday morning meeting together. I don't know how we're going to do it, but we're going to do it. So I don't know how we're going to do it, but we are going to do it in Jesus' name. As we start to plan for that, as we start to prepare for that, God will give us the rest of the information. But at the moment, I'm inspired. I've got the inspiration. The information will come next. I've got the inspiration. I'm prepared for per per more perspiration. Right? But we're going to go for it. Imagine in this city, a place where several thousand people are. Me you see, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not a sort of pastor who wants to fill a stadium for an event. No, I'm not. I'm not interested in a massive big event for one day. That doesn't float my boat. I'm interested in thousands of people meeting every Sunday as the church of Jesus Christ so that we get filled up, postcoded out and sent in Jesus' name. Right? Because the point of the matter is, is that it's often been said Christians are like manure. If you stick us all together, we can smell a bit. But if you spread us out, we cause fantastic growth wherever we go. And I believe that that's, there's something of that in God, in us. It's great to do the thing together. It's great to get the fill up. It's great to get the fuel in the tank for the journey. But then we need to do the journey and reach the people furthest away from the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus said, You shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. He did not put some big gap in between receiving power and going. He said the power is to go. If you don't go, you don't get the power. So if you're staying, and all we do is stay, like the person who fell asleep who had the dream, then you won't get the authority and you won't get the power working in your life for your dream to come into reality. But if you, if, if you wait upon the Lord and you get something from God and then you start to travel and you start to, you start to move forward and you progress on that, you, that's, that's called the walk of faith. And as you begin to put one foot in front of another and walk the walk of faith, you will find he will even open seas and oceans so that you can walk forward in Jesus' name. That's what the Red Sea teaches us. That's what the River Jordan teaches us, that we can cross over by supernatural means if we are going forward in Jesus' name. That's what he teaches us, It doesn't it? If it doesn't teach us that, then I'm sorry, it doesn't teach us anything. Wow, I'm going. Your chicken's burnt. But it doesn't matter we can leave it as a burnt offering, can't we? Yesterday I was 
I was planning in my garden and strategizing where we're building the 80th, 81st, 82nd, and 83rd back churches in India. Right? And this is the point why I'm sharing this. Because 14 years ago, I went to a tiny little church held in a pastor's house. All his belongings were on a, a peg round the corner on the wall and we used his tiny house where he and his wife, his son and daughter-in-law and their children and his daughter and son-in-law and their children live in one room. In that room we did church. The only room for me to preach was a tiny dining room table where they put the food sometimes on there, that's it, and they all just help themselves. And I put my Bible on that table there's a lot of movement going on in there with insects and creepy crawlies and everything. Anyway, that's another story. And all the people jammed into that room, and there was as many people, if not more people, outside waiting to hear. 30 to 40 people gave their lives to Jesus Christ on that mission. But we had nowhere to put them. We had nowhere to bring them. The pastor said, Pastor, if we can, please. And he walked me around, and he showed me all his belongings. Every time he has church, all his belongings go on several hooks on the wall. And then he has church in his house. Then he, bring, he gets rid of them all later on at night, and then he brings them all back, and they eat together, and that's it. He says, it, this wall that is my house on the outside, if we put another wall against it, we can have church. I thought, what a great idea. He says, I, I own the land. I got it from my 40 years working in the railway. How about giving up everything he'd worked for in order to have a church. Isn't that, isn't, that, isn't that just absolutely amazing when you say, I will build my church and the gates of hell should not prevail against it? He, got, he caught that in his spirit. So we said to him, and this is the name of the village, it just, just come to me, I was trying to rack my brains. And it's called Odapali. Odapali. It is quite odd. We built our first ever church building in Odapali. 14 years ago. Now we're on number 84. Why? Why? Because not only did we have a good idea, God gave us a plan. And we created a plan to build more and more. In one year, we built nearly 10 churches. Thank God. When you start, you see, you don't know, you don't know what can happen where you are right now. Can you stand a moment? We're done. I want you to stand. I want, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm appealing to you. Young people, you're at the beginning of your life. This applies to you in absolute bucket loads. All of your life is before you. Dreams are good to dream. Dreams are God-given. It's good to have aspirations. And I, I say what I said at the Eritrean and or, or to all the young people. The, your likes and dislikes and the things that you love and that you're skillful at and that you're good at, there's an indication there of what God wants you to do in the future. Because he hasn't gifted you those gifts to not be used. That's part of your DNA. It's part of who you are. But we have to go from where we are now. We can't stay where we are now. We have to progress here, right? So if you're going to be a writer, start writing. Don't wait for somebody to give you a script. If you're going to be, if you're going to be a businessman, start with your pocket money. If you're going to be a businesswoman, and you're going to be somebody, start where you are. If you're going to be a preacher, start where you are. If you're going to be a pastor, start where you are. If you're going to be into mission, start where you are. If you're going to be a hairstylist, start practicing on your sister. <laughs> Hopefully she's gracious. If you, if you, whatever you're going to, if you're going to be a musician, practice. God's not going to come down and suddenly give you the gift of being the best musician in town. You're going to have to, if you keyboard, you're going to have to do what Tom does. Play until three in the morning. Or if you're going to be a singer, sing, practice singing. All different kinds of singing, right, Mark? Oh, yeah. Whoa. If you're going to be a speech and language therapist, see, Joe. 
Do you understand what I'm saying? You've got to start somewhere. If you're going to be a restaurateur, start learning, cooking, not, not just doing beans and egg. <laughs> Try something a bit adventurous. Go and cook for someone. Yeah, go and invite one of the pastors. Nelly, he's good at that. He will test your food out to the max. You know what I'm saying here, guys? Come on, have a plan. Do something. Don't do nothing. As my father-in-law always used to say to me, God will not bless nothing. He can he bless nothing. He must bless. He must have something to bless. That's why, Lord, time and time again, the Lord says, what's in your hand? What's in your house? I have a small bowl. That'll do nicely. What's in your hand? A staff. That's exactly what I'm looking for. We thought we had nothing. God says you've got enough to get you to where you need to go next. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Right, I'm going to pray for you right now. I'm going to pray for you right now. I'm going to pray for those people. You, you're going to have to take the jump from being a cultural Christian today. Missional Christian, missional Christian, who's prepared to go and be God's mouthpiece, his ambassador, his transportation in taking the presence of God. Who's willing for that? Who's willing for that? Who's willing to do that for God? Who's willing to be a vessel right now for God? Who has dreams right now? that need to be fulfilled. Have you got any dreams? Father, I pray over these dreams. Wow, and this is something I really believe that the Lord is saying to me over somebody who's older, middle-aged, and the Lord says, I'm taking the expiration date off your dream. Did you hear that? I'm taking the expiration date that you've put on your dream. I'm taking it off and your dream is about to come back to life again in Jesus' name. Because God has not done with that dream yet. You have, he hasn't. He is the God of resurrection. He is the God of new life and God is going to resurrect that dream and it's not finished. It's not done. It's not the end. There's been a hiatus in the middle, but God says, I'm going to re-invoke that dream. I'm going to cause that dream to live again. Wow. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I'm going to pray for you. Young people, 